Welcome back to positionspecific.com and coaching journey one. Just want to start the video off by saying a big thank you to everybody who's been getting involved and interacting um, and asking questions around different systems, different sessions. Um, it's been really, really good. You know, we're, we're trying to get back to, to everybody. Um, apologies that if we, if we haven't been able to touch base with you, but we do every day spend a bit of time just looking through the comments on all the different social media platforms and Hopefully we have we have reached out to to majority of you. It's just good to see that people are really enjoying the journey and taking things from it. You know, I just want to highlight this in us um, telling people this is the way. What we're saying is this is just an idea of of how we do things and something that we've found successful um, in our coaching career. But again, we're always developing. We're always trying to grow. Um, as you can see, if you've been following the journey, we've tweaked a few things. And we're just trying to, to shape it so it looks good going into the second part of the season. But thank you again for everybody who's who's been following the journey so far. Don't forget to press that like button. Um, subscribe if you haven't subscribed and turn on the notifications so you're not missing these videos now. So on to week 12. We're going to start off with a, a game review around the Man United game. We're then going to look at three sessions. So session one is going to be individual development. We're then going to move on to a short, sharp um, practice, um, looking at small-sided games and some technical work. And then session three is going to be around position-specific work because we're not leading into, into a game. What we've done is we've gone off a, a coach's request. Um, because we've got no game plan, we decided to have a look through some, uh, some of the messages. We're going to have a look at the one three three one three formation and just how it looks against different systems. So just looking at the Man United game, for people who've been watching the, the journey so far, you'll understand that this is the, the, the second game against each other. Um, first game was a cracking game, and, and, and this sort of lived up to, to that hype as well. So we set out to play in a 4-3-3, moving into a 3-4-3 three, three, or a 2-3-2-3. Two, three, two, three. Again, just depending on the personnel that we had on the pitch and what we're playing against. We're comfortable with this because we know what Man United would play. They're similar to us. They have a, a set structure that they'll start with and then just adapt as the game goes on. So starting off with a team identity and targets like we always do. As you can see, it was very 50-50 when we're talking about imposing our identity on the opposition. So looking at the defensive transition, Unfortunately, this is the lowest that we had throughout the season. I think it was um, not so much too much to do with us. I think it was just some some parts of, um, where Man United's quality came out, um, especially in like the 1v1 duels. So when, when the transition happened and we was intense and, and pressing the ball, um, they had some good players in there which could could beat that initial press. Um, so it was... It was a really, really good challenge, but there were some parts that we did really well. I just think that maybe some of the maybe the one v one technical skill sort of let us down at, at times. Uh, but credit to Man United, you're going to have that when you're playing a team like them. They're going to have players in there which which uh, are going to be good at them one v one duels to break that that first initial press. So looking at the defensive organisation again, we're just under our target. These sort of, sort of married up to each other. So remember, if we don't win the ball back within them three passes, we move into the defensive organisation. So if you can picture this, uh, we've lost possession. We go and press the ball. We have one or two players. That player then breaks the press, um, finds maybe a, a pass. Um, they then start to progress up the pitch. We move into our defensive organisation, uh, which was more set up as a, as a counter-attack. So this was up and down. So there was moments in the game where we were above our target and then we just dropped down late on when we were, were actually um, pushing more bodies forward late in the game. But then looking at the, the attacking side, you know, attacking transition, we found the second pass completion well. So we're over our target. Yes, it was close, but we're still over it. And then 38% of the time, we, we got into um, the final third. So we were happy with that. I'll just give you a bit of a breakdown of, of what this looks like. I know some people have asked us as well because we did a little bit on the defensive transition. So if we're just looking at the performance metrics of the attacking organisation, so remember our target is, is to try get into the final third 35% of the time 
of when we're in the attacking organisation. It's just the performance wheel, so shape, support, speed, supply, so the message that we're always relaying to the players. And if we're just looking at the game, there was actually um, 80 times we're in the attacking organisation. Now, the attacking organisation for us is um, after we've completed two passes or a dead ball situation. So that could be us um, building from the keeper from a goal kick. It can be a throw-in, free kick or corner. So 80 times we were in the attacking organisation. Everything else obviously was in, in the transition. But there was 80 times in this game. So we got into the final third 31 times, which is 38% of the time. So we were happy with that. But then when we start to look at the penalty area entries, you're talking six, so only 19% from that 31. Um, again, the reason why we use this, and it's, we don't show the players this too much, this just helps us as coaches um, understand where we need to do more work on the training pitch. Um, and what we do is if we don't just go off one game, we start to look at patterns. So we don't just press the, the panic button because of one game we haven't got into the penalty area. What we do is we just make a note of it to, to sort of let us know in future that this might be something that we need to work on more. So how effective was we when we got into the final third? We had nine shots and we had five on target and four off, which, you know, we're, we're quite happy with, with that side of it. The only thing that we were disappointed with was the um, entries into the penalty area. But again, that just gives you an idea of, of the performance metrics and what it looks like. Hopefully that's clear. Um, again, if there's any questions, just, just fire them in, in the comments below. So just looking at the performance review, so looking at the game. So systems of play is what we expected, 4-3-3 against a 4-2-3-1. So we're happy with the matchups. This um, The players know how to play the system well, so the Man United, so that's why it's such a good game. We know our pressing patterns, we know to find the mark and change the mark, so we're happy with that. If you're going back off the game plan from last week, some of the stuff that you've seen, um, we, we try to implement into this game. What I would say is we had to adjust our defensive midfielders positioning um, quite early in the game because of, of what Man United was doing. So just for the people who, um, who didn't see the last game plan or the last game against Man United, what they like to do is, is press with their central forward and then like to jump press from, uh, from the cam. And what we did in the last game is we started to get control between the two centre-backs and the four because we'd pinned back their two midfielders. That was in the last game, which helped us get control. So just looking at that, that's how they were pressing. When the ball shifted wide, then their, their wide forwards would then go and press, and then they'd try to keep us on one side of the pitch. And we, we knew that the Man United was going to do this, and then um, we worked on this a little bit um, in last week's training sessions. If you haven't yet seen that, make sure you check out um, last week's journey. What Man United did do a lot better in this game was the distances between the defensive line and forward line. So these two midfielders wasn't getting too caught up on our on our cams. What they were doing is they were squeezing right on and making that distance really compact so we couldn't really get control in there. And there was moments where it was really good where we did actually get it into the four, but it had to be really smooth. Um, if we were to be successful. So there was a high risk of us losing the ball in here and then breaking on us down the central area. So that's why I talk about that we had to adjust the defensive midfielders positioning um, quite quickly. Now, it's not that we're trying to, to make it easier for the four because we do like to tend to keep him in there and, and, and work his, his, his sort of individual challenges on scanning and receiving. But it was just at a point where it was really, really congested in there and tight. So we needed to get control of the game. But credit to, to, to Man United because um, they'd obviously looked at the last game and, and um, really tightened up on that side of the game. So what we did is we just got the four to, to drop in onto the defensive line, similar to the last game. And then we just went to a one-on-one. -on -one. So some of the stuff that we worked on in the session in, in, in the last journey. Um, something that we're just playing with 
what we would say is because the distances was tight, that their midfielder now was actually locking on and going with them. So this was really, really important that the midfielder got the timing right and the pass was right. Now, luckily, these are good players. So his pass detail are really good. And one of our cams timing is very good at arriving at the same time as a ball. So we did get a bit of success from this. So when he'd stay high, play the ball into space, arrive, and then we'd find the centre-back. And then that's where we'd um, exploit the space to go forward. And this is sort of how we got into, into the attacking third against, against Man U. Just to give you an overview of like basically how we relayed it to the, to the team is in possession, just going to a 3-4-3 and out of possession to a 4-3-3. A really, really simple transition. It was just around the four, four stepping in and dropping back in, um, making sure that the full backs are always in a position where, when it breaks down, that they can defend. But we were quite happy with this, and it's solid as well because if we lose the ball, we've got three in central areas, which allows everybody to, to retreat. But ho hopefully, that sort of paints a picture of, of why we do it. Now, if we're dominating the ball, and their their pressing um, patterns are, are quite right. Then we'll keep the foreign and dominate the ball. You know, in between the lines. But for us, we just felt that the distance was distances were really good, so we had to drop to a three. So looking at the defensive organisation again, something that that Man United must have been working on. Um, you know, last last game that we played, we caused them all sorts of problems in these areas. And and again, for people who've been following us, they'll, they'll understand that we force the ball to left centre-back in most games just because we, we know there's not many left-footed centre-halves around. Um, and we're just trying to force them onto the right foot to go inside or play the harder pass. What I would say is, is the both centre-backs were very good at fixing the space and uh, eliminating that press. Um, so what we found a couple of times when the ball went in, we'd get the press right, but they would just step in and take the nine and seven out of the game. And this player was like bigger and stronger um, than our players who were playing a pressure. So straight away with a couple of strides, they run to our midfield line, which then give us some sort of problems in here around changing the mark. Um, so for instance, someone's got to engage and change the mark. And they just found a couple of times sort of, through them lines. So we saw this as a performance problem. Um, we did shift the ball to the other side, but then the right centre-back was 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 good at it as well. So credit to Man United. They've obviously been working on it. They've watched the last game again. So it, it was good because it gave us a, a few things to, to think about. What we did is we, instead of the nine setting the scene, we just asked the nine to stay central. So try to work these three central channels. Um, and then we still press from the 7-11. So there's a couple of things. We could push the 7 on them and, and force them into a long pass, and we'll press on the full back. But what we did is we wanted to allow these to have the ball because they've been working on it, so we're trying to set traps. So you're looking at the scenario here. We're just creating this little V-shape, so we'll keep the 9 in. So because they'd obviously been working on it, their first touch was always to go inside, so we were happy with that. We kept the nine in here, but what we were saying to the nine is, as soon as they take the touch inside, go and press or double press. When the ball went back to the keeper, we allowed them to have it. We allowed them to have it. You know, that was something that we were, we were happy with. Now, yes, usually we do want to go and jump press the keeper, but we didn't want to get picked off. What that does is it leaves the two fullbacks free. So if he was to take a touch on the inside and play that ball under pressure, then well done to the centre-back. But we're saying... Go and be aggressive, go and get on his touch, double press, don't allow him that. If they then played the link pass, and again, I think everybody will be familiar with what we do, the midfielder will change the mark, the seven will come in, and the nine will, will lock him in. Okay. Again, if, if it's something that you're not familiar with, just make sure you check back on the, on the journey videos and, and, and we work on this, and we're always talking to players about it. But this just helped us out, um, and what you found is they were playing into these areas, and we won the ball quite a bit, and then we are breaking on them. Um, so it was really, really interesting. But again, credit to, to Man U, you know, um, some of the players stepped up to the mark and, and, and the staff had obviously been watching some of the stuff that we'd done in the last game. So credit to them. But this is what it's about. It's about being uh, adaptable and, and being able to adjust uh, within the game. And, and play, our players are, 
um, are definitely doing that at the moment. So credit to our players as well. There was other other performance problems, but I didn't really want to go into it too much in here. Um, if you look back at the targets, one of them was a the transition. You know, and I, and again, the only thing I can really say about that is is um, when we went and pressed that first ball when we'd lost it, they had a couple of players in there which could just break that initial press. Um, we sort of we sort of kept it. We didn't really change that um, because because Man United was actually leading one nil. Um, the game actually ended one nil because they were leading. The game was quite open, and we just wanted to keep going, and we wanted to go for it. So we just started to commit more bodies higher up the pitch, and and that's why them stats sort of um, dropped off slightly. Because as you can imagine, it was a bit of an end to end game. It was a cracking game to watch. Um, and credit to both teams. So on to week 12 then, three sessions as normal. We actually did a, um, fit in a fourth session this week because we didn't have a game, but I haven't, I haven't stuck it in, in this plan. It was just more around um, fun activities for the players. So we had them set into, into like groups and they were going around competing against each other in different activities. If you do want us to, to throw that out, just leave a comment below. But we just thought we'd stick with the, the theme that we've been going with, so the three sessions then into a game or, or coach's request. So session one was ILP work um, and then moving into attack v defence. We had the national team in on this at night, so they were in to see how we run um, our programme, wanted to have a look at a few players. So this worked really well because we put the, the players in isolated drills within their position. So that was good for the national team to, to have a look at that. Session two, we just did some rondos and small-sided games, so just some simple conditions around our game model. And then session three, some more ILP work, but more units. So we broke them off into, into attacking uh, and, and defending. So the attackers went off and worked on some patterns. Defenders went on and worked on some techniques and then moved into a 9v9 game. And then we're going to have a look, because we haven't got a game, we're going to have a look at the, the one of the coaches' requests, which was a 1-3-3-1-3 system of play. So we've just all we've done is we've just married that up against different systems. Um, and then we'll just give you a couple of pointers of what we see. So looking at session one, individual development and TAC v defence. So real simple technical warm-up, but a lot of detail. Um, and something that we, we try to, we don't throw it into um, all our sessions and, and, and put them up on the journey all the time. But we do do a lot of these drills in and out of possession. Um, really simple drill, um, but really focusing on, on some of the defending techniques around footwork, body shape and recovery. So all we're going to do is I'll just let it, I'll just let it play. So... The scenario here, you have the players in pairs, one player dribbles with the ball, but at 50% speed. When they get towards the goal, they pull the leg back like they're gonna they're gonna cross a ball or play a pass or a shot. The one player here, number two, so on the inside, must then exaggerate like they're gonna block the ball. Okay. And then it's a little race across to the opposite line. And we don't want this player to cheat. What we want them to do is exaggerate like they've blocked or gone to block the ball and then they've been done on the inside and then we're looking at the recovery. So what we're saying to the player here is, and you'll find where the players will turn the long way around, what we're saying is can they plant the foot, twist the hips and then accelerate so what you're looking at here is, is like the, the fine detail of footwork and then how they readjust to then get an advantage of winning this race. So as you can see here, and then we're looking at 100%. Once they get across here, they'll work the same thing, but the opposite way. And then the next two will get ready. So same thing here, dribble across, exaggerate, and then recover. It's just a real simple technical drill, but we feel it just helps um, all players within our team to to get better in the 1v1 duels and also work on the what-if scenarios of when they've been beat. 
And it's really, really important. I, I've watched professional footballers where the footwork's all over the place. Um, and if they'd have done more of this stuff when, when they were younger, they've had more of an advantage against um, good attackers. If you need to see any of the detail, it's all in and around the practice here. I'm pretty sure that you'll be familiar with, with this session plan. So just looking at the um, attack v defence. So we had three parts. So I'll just, I'll let it play. So as you can see here, the, we've got the setup here with the goals. Again, all the details over to the left-hand side. Um, the reds are the attacking players. So right wingers would be over this side, left wingers would be over here. And then we had our more central players here. So cams and um, centre forwards. And then we had centre backs, holding midfielders actually here as well. And then we had our full backs working either side. So part one was uh, working on front pressure. So I'll, I'll run through it with you. So here, the coach would feed the ball into the winger, so they would do a little movement, so they get into good habits. Receives the ball, and then the fullback comes from this gate here. So the attacker is conditioned, because remember, it's an isolated drill, and we're wanting both players to get better in their position. So the 11 could dribble through this gate here to get a point, or they could dribble down the side and cross it into the mini goal for a point the white just needs to focus on winning the ball as number one objective and two just playing it back into the coach so you've got this little 1v1 uh, duel out here so again when i'm talking about the national team watching it it's brilliant because they're getting a good look at our our fullbacks our wingers how they manipulate each other in the central area the keeper clips the ball in and as you could tell, the nine's objective is to go and beat him and score in a goal. If the centre-back slash midfielder wins the ball, okay, they can just play into the next player for a point. Same thing down this side. I was on the other side. So the red's trying to get through the gate or scoring a goal. Part two is back pressure. So you're just changing the start of the practice. So as you can see, they're up against each other, plays into the feet, same principle. If the 11 can get through the gate, gets a point, beats him, scores, and they gets a point. And then obviously the defender's just trying to uh, win the ball, play it into the coach. But again, just a different scenario, things that would happen in a game. So clipped out, pinned, good, wins the ball, plays it out. Same thing down this side. And we love these drills, real, real isolated drills, so you can really look at the, the technique of each player. This one now is focused around the recovery, so the what-if scenarios. So, as you can see, the coach has a ball in the hand. The player drops off, so a double movement, so drops below and then runs beyond. And what you do is you get the fullback to exaggerate to go with them, and then... It's how they recover. So looking back at that footwork we talked about earlier. So twisting the hips to then get into a sprint to recover. Again, if the player can go straight across here, they get a point, if not into there. So you're looking at the defender to recover on the inside to deny this. And then once they get into this area, you're looking to stop the cross. But it's really important that you get the fullback to exaggerate that step. Same thing in here. So that little movement. In beyond, how do you recover? So just working on the what-ifs. Again, if you're looking at the attacking play, just working on the double movement to then get across the man. So loads of detail that you can bring out of this. Um, but it's good for the coaches to have a look at the fine detail um, of the attacking play and defending play. And it's up to you. If there's only one coach, I would just focus on, on maybe one element. And so you might let the attackers just attack how they want and you work with the defenders or vice versa. We're fortunate enough, enough that we've got a few coaches. So one coach was giving the attackers information and the other coach was giving the defenders information. Um, if you've got multiple players, you know, you can just have a queue here of players and just keep changing this over because it can be physically demanding. Same thing here. Um, if you have got small, smaller numbers, you might just move the wingers and fullbacks all to work on one side and then take them over to the other side so they get more um, time to recover 
Okay, but that's up to you as a coach to, to manage that. But it is physically demanding if you haven't got big numbers. So then moving on to a phase of play, trying to stick with the same theme, as you can see here, split the pitch up into to five channels like um, the drill before. You've got a back four and a holding midfielder and then attackers. We didn't give them too much information. We just let them play, but they're in the scenario of what they would be in a game. So you're trying to create these little 1v1 duels, uh, 2v1s, and then obviously looking at the whites to defend um, the box and then look to score in here. So we're just looking at the point systems here. If whites, uh, sorry, if reds get the ball, um, they get one point for, for a dribble, pass, or cross into the 18-yard box. One point for a shot on target. Two points for for a goal or an assist. So what we said is, is we just give them individual targets. So when we said, let's use the 11 as example. They have to play for three minutes and they're trying to get as many points as they can individually and collectively. So obviously the collective goal is to score a goal. The individual is just little simple um, challenges. So can they dribble, pass or cross into the area to get a point? If they get a shot on target, they get a point. And then two points for a goal and assist. So they've got their individual targets within three minutes. Same for the whites as well. One point for winning the ball in their zone. So an example, if you're um, a centre-back in here and you win it across the three central zones, they'll get a point, same as the four. If the ball goes wide as a full-back, so if they win the ball in this wide channel or the inside channel, they get a point. If the ball is delivered into the box and they get first contact, they get a point as well. So if the left winger crosses it to the back post and the three heads it out for for a corner or clears it or gets first contact to get a point for that. And obviously two points for, for scoring in the goals here. Well, hopefully that makes sense. Everything else is just a game. Offsides are in. Um, if you want to work on a bit of throwing, you can put throwings in. If you want corners, goal kicks, entirely up to you. I like a variation. So if it goes out for a goal kick, I like them to try build against these numbers to make it difficult. If you've got more numbers, you can obviously adjust the numbers on, on how you want to play it. So you might have more on the whites. It's entirely up to you. So that was session one. So session two, Rondo and then into small-sided games. Really simple practice. Um, didn't want to overload the players at all. We just wanted them to get a feel of a ball and just enjoy training. So we started off with a simple 5v2 rondo, working through the individual process, scan, move, receive, release. 10 by 10 area. We had two of these set up. So we spoke about um, the supporting angles, so beside, below, beyond, making sure that, that your body shape's always open to see the next pass draw the defenders in, switch the play, just little things like that. Um, we changed the, the conditions. So one of the conditions that we, we added was if they won the ball back collectively within five passes, they both come out. Anything more than that is the longest serving defender. So that starts to implement some of the stuff that from our game model. So we're looking at that quick transition to go win the ball. We had supplier footballs around, so it was quick fire. So as soon as the ball went dead, throw the bibs down, um, get the next ball in as fast as possible. So we're really looking at that transition work. Then in possession, like I've just said, just just them simple movements, but making sure that they're working through scan, move, receive, release. So just looking at the SSG here. So again, you'll have seen some of the work around this. We just wanted to keep everything really close. I think if you go back to the game review of Man United um, we just wasn't good enough in and around the box so what we felt is is we just throw a little session on in the middle of play uh, in the middle of the week working on SSGs and, and quick shooting so just little conditions that we give the players in here um, one point for scoring two points for scoring from the attacking half so if they score from this half um, they get one. If they can get into the attacking half and score, they get two. So going back to some of the stuff that we felt that we needed to work on from the last game. But just making sure that everybody in here is just all focused on scoring goals. 
So getting yourself in positions where you can score. If you can't, find someone to score. You know, we wanted to just like quick fire, just just keep the ball moving, get plenty of shots off. It shows in this video that we had players locked in. So you had a four and a three in that half, four and a three in this half. But we just actually let the players play. What we did is we said that this was an offside line. So if they wanted to squeeze right on, they could do. Um, but we just let the players play freely and just focus on trying to get into the box, get shots off. Real high intensity. So make sure that you um, you manage the, the clock. So session three, position specific work. Before this, we just did a little technical drill and then we broke the, the, the players off for different units. So in this session here, they're going to work through four parts. So the ball shifts across from here now. Okay. And then we're just looking at um, specific movements. So little movements to break the line. Um, of the opposition and then score on goal all unopposed performance wheel scan move receive release you know so you're looking at the individual stuff and the team stuff is is shape support speed supply so depending on as a coach what you're going after whether it's individual or team they're the message that you want to be relaying across so just looking at this player gets the ball shifts it into into the wide player Beats the cone down the outside and then looks to cross. And then you're looking at specific attacking areas within within the uh, within the box. Now I could tell you what we do, but I think most coaches have different ways of attacking a box, so we can leave that to to however you'd want to to adapt that bit. So you might get your nine to go across the front, eleven at the back, ten and eight on the edge. Entirely up to you. So once that happens, you've got a three-second window to get back into your shape. Ball goes in here. So if you're watching this time, when the four receives the ball, they go over the top. So it's that same movement to create the space, but now it goes straight over the top there for um, the wide player to arrive onto it and dealing with that, that aerial pass. Three-second recovery. So this time now, same movement again. So you're trying to create that space, open body, and then you're looking for the eight to make the half space run. If you can play this first time, it's near impossible to defend against if they can play it first time. If you get the timing right and the detail of the pass, you know, it, it, for me, it's one, of, it's one of the best passes in the game. Again, just looking, three seconds to recover. In This time we're playing here. Bounce bounce pass, so that's just replicating that the fullback's gone with them. And we can't play forward, it comes in, and then we're looking to switch the play. And then maybe allow the players to just have a little breather. Allow them to have a little breather for maybe 30 seconds and then work down the other way. So it is, it is physically demanding. And if you've got double players, you can just put players on cones so some will work, some will rest. But you're trying to get them to work through all the four patterns as fast as possible. Ball goes in, shifts it into the winger, beats the man, crosses. Second one, the 11 will make the movement again and then receive beyond. Half space this time. In create the space, our space run. And then a little play in, bounce back, switch the play. So they're the little patterns that the um, the attackers were working on. And they worked on that for about half an hour. So on the other side of the pitch, um, where I was working, we were just looking at some uh, defending techniques. So I took the um, centre-backs and full-backs and I had a couple of the defensive midfielders. But what we did with the defensive midfielders, halfway through, we swapped them over. So some was working on the range of pass and some was working on defending techniques. So in this one here, so it was just three parts of the practice. This was just part of a, a little warm-up for the players. So the red player just dribbles with a ball, so 50% speed. 
And then we're looking at the, um, the number two here, shadow defending, working backwards. But you, this line here, so we're just trying to get them to work on the opposite side of this line. And you're just working on the footwork as moving backwards. And then obviously, you know, the good balance, so arm out, and then just how they cross the feet over. So you're just working on that fine detail again of what it looks like when you're moving backwards. As I get halfway, I switch the cone. So you've got to switch your body shape and then you're working backwards on the opposite side. Once you get to the end, just change it over and then the red player is going to be working. I had three of these set up. So I had some working over here and some working over here. So part two. So same thing again to start with. But then when you get to the red cone here, he's then going to accelerate and then it's a little race to get through here. Now, what you don't want to do is just let this player turn and sprint. You still want them to try and gauge and manipulate the attacker here. So you're still wanting that player to do that. Um, what you'll find is you'll see that the player will set off early and spin around the opposite way and forget about the technique. So it's really important that they keep the technique all right, and stay focused. And then when they're in the little race, just trying to get them to manipulate the attacker. So it might be just a little nudge or maybe a pull of the shirt. No tackling, just trying to manipulate them. And same thing again, work the opposite way, going down this side. So 50% as I get to the red cone, change of speed. Now that's something that you can add actually to the drill that you can get the attacker to change at any time because it can come predictable from there. So you might get the attacker to change speed here um, in there, just leave it up to them, which just makes it a little bit more realistic. But remember, this is just about getting the technique out. And then the last one is two players are ball in, it's a 1v1 duel. So the attacker, one point if the dribble across the halfway line, two points if they um, pass through the gate. So what you're trying to get the defender to do is engage high and stop them from getting across the line. If they get across the line, you're looking for them to block the pass into the gate. If the defender wins the ball high up the pitch, it's two points. If they stop them from scoring in the bottom half, it's a point. And a bonus point as well if they win it and then play through the gate. So again, really simple practice, but a lot of detail. And for me, you know, like... Um, you don't see in the modern game um, enough players who are good in 1v1 duels when you're looking at the defensive side of the game. You know, players who spring to mind like Maldini, um, you know, like that were just just phenomenal um, defenders. And I, and I watch clips back all the time of some of the old school defenders, especially some of the Italians. So part two was, was more around um, anticipation, and then clearing the lines of the box. So just going to run through it with you. So they play a little one-two pass there. And then the coach can can fire the ball into one of the gates, uh, goal, sorry. And the, the defender will look to try block that. Um, just make sure that the, the goals are a little bit closer. It should really be two strides. So you're looking at uh, two strides to go and block. Once they've blocked one side or it goes in the net, the coach will have a next ball to fire into the other goal. So you're looking at that quick reaction. Once that happens, the ball then gets delivered into the box and then they're looking to, to clear the ball. So you're looking at like the, the clearing um, skills. Again, little bounce, goes in, reacts on the other block, recover, and then looking to defend. Change sides. And again, just change personnel around. Um, change sides. Or just making sure that, that you're um, you're getting in the fine detail with the players. We used to um, we used to have a heading part, so we used to have a part here where you'd vary this. So they'd go in and, and win a header, and then they'd go and block block a shot. But obviously, with the the rules around how many headers you can have within a training practice, it sort of hindered that a little bit. Um, you know, obviously one of the the main things is you can get a sponge ball and work on it, but we just um, decided to just work with um, blocking the ball and then just clearing the, clearing the box. And then we just moved into, this was actually a 9v9 game. 
I know it's got um, eight on there, but we just moved into a little game at the end. We actually had an extra body in each team. And some of you have seen this before. So uh, four games playing with three minutes at the high intensity. So everybody's got to work at the, the, the highest capacity. So that means um, sprint everywhere, in possession, trying to win the back, double movements. If someone's following, you lose them. And you're trying to get the players to be stressed out, but working at their, their max. Game two, we then moved into two five-minute games. And then we put the overload on one side. The team who uh, was underloaded was 2-0 up. So the team in possession had five minutes to break them down and get themselves back into the game. And the team who was underloaded was looking to defend um, and see out the win. Losing team does a forfeit. After five minutes, then we flipped the, uh, the roles. So the other team now was, was um, a negative two. And then the last two games, which was five minutes, normal games, um, 9v9. Again, just it's just scenario-based, um, just trying to make sure that, that the players understand different um, parts of the game. It might be um, that you're chasing the game. So if you go back to the Man United game, we were 1-0 down um, and we're trying to break them down. There was some really good stuff late on and how the players adapted um, was good, but we just unfortunately couldn't get through them lines. So I think it's really important that, that you put the players in these scenarios all the time. Flip it. So you might be underloaded, might have had a player sent off, might have a player off the pitch. Um, you might have a lead that you need to look after. I think the, all these types of things help the players um, like progress through their career in the future. So trying to paint as much pictures as we can. So just wanted to make you aware of our Christmas deal. So we've decided to put both of our defensive midfielders book in and out of possession um, into a package and it's only £5. So that's both books for £5. If you haven't yet purchased any of the books, then it's great that you can go on and get both of them for this price. Anybody who follows um, our journey and the coaches will understand that 99% of our content is, is free, and we want to try to keep it that way. Why we have to put a cost to these books is because we have to keep an upkeep for the, for the website. Um, again, we, we try to keep the, the books at a low price because we know it's a tough industry out there to, to try to stay um, up to date with the game, with qualifications and, and buying books and things like that. So that's why we try to keep uh, um, everything cost effective. Um, so thank you to everybody who actually has purchased it um, and been leaving feedback. You know, it's, it's really appreciated. And like I say, it just helps us running the, uh, helps us keep running the website. Also, if you want to jump into our weekly draw, just leave a comment below or send us a private message saying hashtag coaching journey. Um, and then we'll stick you into a weekly draw. If you win that, we'll send you both of these books free of charge. But Merry Christmas. So looking at the coach's request for this week, um, looking through all the comments and, and what we felt was quite a popular one was um, the systems of play around the one three three one three 3 3 one 3 formation. There was a couple of people who had mentioned this. There is other comments and um, things that people want to see that, that, that we'll introduce over the next couple of weeks. Uh, one that springs to mind was around throw-ins. For this week, we're just going to purely focus on this system. Now, this is just a brief overview. You know, like we could spend hours talking about, about systems and uh, what it looks like in and out of possession and the transition and um, the ways that we'd adapt against different systems. But for us, we, you know, that, that, that could take a long time. Um, and it's something that we might try do like a, a live stream over, over Christmas and, and, and get coaches involved and maybe do something like that. If it's something that you'd be interested in, you know, leave your comments below and press that like button. Um, but for now, this is just going to be a brief overview on a couple of stuff that we, we think against different systems. So as you can see here, really, really simple. Um, got your GK, three on a defensive line, three on the midfield line. Then you've got a cam that can operate in between. And then you've got your front three. Um, this is a system that, that no, we do like but we wouldn't actually 
go out and just play this system. As anybody knows, following the journey, we like to adapt to suit what we're playing against. But just for this video, we'll we'll just go through some of the key points that, that we feel if you was going to play this as your um, as your main system of play. So just looking at the the back line, any anything that hasn't got um, a yellow tag next to it is just a player playing in a traditional position. So a goalkeeper. Um, defensive midfielder, attacking midfielders, and then forwards. But looking at this defensive line here, for us, and again, this is just our way of playing this system, um, and, and there's no right or wrong, and you might look at it in a different uh, different light, and that's fine. Um, we're just giving you our idea of, of how we would do it if we was to, to play this as a, a system of play every single week. So we would have a, an out-and-out -out centre-back playing in the central area, um, reason uh, for that is just because centre backs recognise danger and want to defend the goal. So I think it's really important that that player in the centre is focused on making sure that um, that they defend. Which you know ultimately that's what defenders are judged on. You know at the end of the game, I know the modern defenders need to be able to play um, and build the attack. But what I'm saying is, is don't move away from having somebody on that defensive line, especially in the centre, who wants to defend. So for us, our preference would be an out-and-out centre-back. If they can build the attack as well, brilliant. So down the side, you can have multiple options. So you can go with centre-backs or you could go with full-backs. And as we sort of move through what it looks like against different systems, we'll give you a couple of ideas of, of why um, it would be important to just play with centre-backs or full-backs. Um, for us, we like to play with players who play as full-backs because when they're going to get dragged into wide areas, they're familiar with, with that area and dealing with 1v1 jewels. Again, in an ideal world, we'd like to have a lefty and a righty in there as well, which would help us sort of be unpredictable when we're building. In the defensive midfielder um, or central midfielder, that's fine. And then I think the two left, uh, left and right players here could be fullbacks or midfielders, um, depending on, on what you're trying to get for the opposition. Just remember, in any game, you will have players in your team who will naturally move into different positions. So if you were to put a fullback in this role here, Without you saying anything, unless you restricted them um, and you was telling them this is what you want them to do, if you're in possession, this player would probably drift wide. And that could be a positive or a negative, um, depending on what you wanted to get from the game. But for us, um, we'll mix this up and play with, with fullbacks or midfielders. Um, if they're going to be a fullback, they've got to be technically good because they're going to be playing in these areas and, and be under pressure um, against most systems. Obviously, you're attacking midfielder and then your front three, so left forward, right forward, central forward. So let's just have a look at what it looks like against uh, different, different formations. Now, for this video, we're just going to look at five different systems with four on a defensive line. Okay, now we could talk about the other five, the three at the back, but we can leave that for another video. So we're purely just going to talk about the 3-3-1-3 three, three, three against five systems with four on a defensive line. And the first one we're looking at is a 4-3-3. Three, three. So I think if you just look at this um, straight away, this forward line we're happy with because it's only a negative one. Um, you've got the plus one in midfield. And then obviously within this system, um, against quite a few of the, the formations, you're always going to be equal numbers. So I think it's really important that these three defenders um, can cover ground quickly uh, and then good in 1v1 duels, if that's something that you're going to go with. So if you were looking at in possession, playing against a 4-3-3, three, three. so for us, we would build 4v3. So we'd do a lot of sessions around 4v3, trying to eliminate one of these. What we'd do in the midfield areas, we'd get the... Um, the defensive midfielder to operate in these three central areas. So always working off the back of these three and would push our two midfielders nice and wide to really stretch that second line. So if these, if that player there jumps onto the DM, we've got the outlet and vice versa. If them two go wide, then we should be able to get through on the, on the defensive midfielder. Obviously, the forwards are just trying to pin back the defensive line and they can trying to keep their four occupied. But in possession, 
these are the areas that you can really, really hurt a 4-3-3. Three, three. As long as these are brave enough to play with uh, the GK being the plus one. But something that you'd have to work on quite a bit um, so they're comfortable at doing it. Out of possession, this is what it looks like. So for us, if we're just using as an example, quite simple pressing patterns, um, forcing the ball where you want it to go. The player here is key, whether you want to be aggressive or a little bit more negative. So to give you an example, you could bump on your cam to go 4v4 to be really aggressive and one of the midfields will step on and the DM will go on. So that's a really aggressive way of pressing the opposition. What you will be forcing the opposition to do is to play long, which is equal numbers on your defensive line. Now, for us, we would probably get our defensive midfielder to drop on the defensive line to give us a plus one. Um, but again, it depends on the state of the game. But real, real subtle um, change from being aggressive and a negative. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So that play is really key to, to how you want to want to change that system there. So looking against the 4 2 3 one, so very, very similar, but the distances are just different in midfield. So again, same principles. We would look at this. Obviously, they're going to have a closer player to your defensive midfielder. So for, for us, it would be about them dragging um, the attacking midfielder to, to one side of the pitch to try to exploit the others. Again, you're looking at that 3v3, depending on how brave they are. Now, they might stay deep. If they stay deep, you control the game with your two um, centre-backs, so left and right. If they push on, then you've got this little 2v1 scenario. If the defensive midfielder wants to come that far out, then it creates space in here. So that's why we're pushing these two wide again. Remember, if you go back to the start, if these two were full-backs, they'd be going into natural positions. So if the defensive midfielders get dragged out, you've probably got more of an advantage because they're in an area that they've played in more than them. So just something to, to, to think about. So again, just that was just highlighting that. So out of possession, this is what it'd look like. So the key player now becomes the cam. So for us, again, it can be aggressive, so they can step on and go 4v4, locked on in midfield, quite like that. And then what you're doing is you're forcing the opposition to go long. But just remember that you've got equal numbers on your defensive line. If you're comfortable with that, that's fine. What I would suggest is if it's something that you're going to go with, you'll probably play against a 4 3 3 or 4 2 3 1 quite a bit. Um, so I would work with this, um, I'd work this scenario quite a lot. So I'd work on a lot of 1v1 defending and um, direct play with this with this three. But quite like the matchups here, um, and I think you'd get quite a bit of success, especially with a team who who um, want to just keep building all the time and, and not play direct or don't have the physical attributes to play direct. So looking at the 4-4-2, Again, the same matchup on the uh, attacking line, so it's a negative one. Happy with that. Um, this is where it'd be quite interesting in midfield because the distances will be quite stretched. So I think in possession you could dominate this middle area. Out of possession you might get a bit stretched, but we'll talk about it in a second. And then you've got your obviously three v two. So in possession you could cause some real problems, especially if they're midfield four or flat. So what we would say is is can the uh, left centre midfield and right centre midfielder try to occupy the two players? So if they can occupy the seven and eight, brilliant. So try to get in between the lines, even go play up against them to keep them wide. What you're asking a question of them is then, is they going to go to a one-on-one -on -one in midfield, which they might do. They might do, but it'll give you three players in the wide channel. But what we're saying is you can be successful from this. If they drop the nine on, if you start to, to dominate the game, then you've got your 3v1, so you should get control of the game. So quite quite happy with that matchup. Out of possession, this can look a couple of ways. So if you was to play with, with these two here as fullbacks, they could just slide out out of possession into a natural position and deal with deal with their two wide forwards. And then you can just go 2v2 in midfield, and you've got your 3v2 there. 
Okay, same one up, up the top, negative one. But if you're working on your pressing patterns and um, changing the mark, you should be okay with that. And the other way of doing it, depending on your personnel, you could just get your midfielder to drop in and become a back four. And then if the two um, players to the left and right, so if we go back to the what we said at the start, so if you're playing with two fullbacks on your defensive line, they can then allow the, the, their wingers to come onto them. So again, they're playing in natural positions. And then you've got your three uh, V2 in the central midfield area. So it looks like a four, two, three, one. So I think that's quite a simple shifting pattern. Um, and again, you just have to balance that around um, your personnel within your team. So looking at the opposition playing a, a 4 3 one, two. Some people will, will um, say diamond, which is fine because you've got that diamond system in there in midfield. So for us, this is a good matchup. This is something that um, if you've been watching the journey, you'll see that we've we've adjusted to this a few times when playing against a, a 4 3 one, two, slash diamond. So as you can see, um, good areas. We've got the plus one on the back to build. We've got equal numbers in midfield and then the negative one at the top, which is fine. So one thing that we like to do, and again, this is just our preference when we're playing this system. And I know that we've we've got a team um, coming up in the next couple of weeks who, who play a diamond. So this is something that we'll start to do. So for me, take, take them away and build with a 4v2. Be aware of if they're jumping from here. But for me, just build with this four. You've got a plus two. You should be able to get out. Um, once you get out, what we ask our wide forwards to do is drop deep to see if the fullback goes with them. If the fullback goes with them, we put um, runners in these areas to go and exploit the half space. So in the game that we're going to be playing in, in, in two or three weeks, we've already noted down that we'll probably play with wingers in here. Um wingers in here so that when we get into these areas and play in there, we're going to pull their midfielders into the areas that they don't want to be in, but our players are familiar with. Um, so that's just that's just one way of, of looking at it for us, but how you could dominate um, that 4-3-1-2 system. And then out of possession, what I've just shown, um, I think it's quite good for, for finding mark and changing the mark. Matched up in midfield, negative one, plus one. And then looking at the the last system with four on a defensive line, which you don't see very often. Um, when I talked about earlier about this team who, who we're playing against in a, a few weeks, they actually play a diamond slash box. They flip between the two. So it'll be interesting to, to see how that game goes. But we've got a couple of ideas of, of how we'll deal with it. So in possession, you can... Again, you're sort of looking at a regular pattern with us with the right centre midfield and left centre midfield are going into wide areas. Again, that's why I would consider maybe playing with fullbacks in them in, in, in that position um, or just making sure that midfielders go wide when we're in there. We're just trying to stretch their second line. Um, if one of these come out, then obviously we've got more numbers to, to exploit the goal. Should be able to build in this area here as well. And then out of possession, um, no reason why you can't just go to a boxing midfield. And and this is the um, one of the things that we're going to look at against this team in a couple of weeks. Um, we're actually going to work on it just to make sure that the team are, are familiar with um, changing from a diamond to a box, which is which will naturally happen in a game anyway, as long as the players understand where the mark is. So hopefully that just gives you a bit of an idea of the... Uh, 3313 system against different systems. Again, I've said it before, we could spend hours um, talking about this. You could break down each system and, and go through exactly how you would build and how many ways you build. Um, you could break down all the um, pressing patterns. You could work in um, the transition. But that, that's for another time. And it's something that we might we might look at um, over the Christmas period, like I said, maybe doing a, a live stream or something, just trying something different. Uh, and seeing if we can engage with you. But hopefully this was this was helpful, um, and the people who, who sent in the request can take something from it. 
if there is any questions, um, again, just fire them in and we'll, we'll try to get back to you. So coming next week, week 13. So as you can see, there's no game. So there won't be any uh, analysis around that. If there's things that you want to see, we'll do a coach's request at the start of the next week's video. So start to rack your brains, have a look at some of the um, the, the content that we've we've put out so far. If there's anything that you want to see, um, we'll have a look and then we'll, we'll, we'll do another coach's request at the start of the next video. Session one at the moment, we've just got it penciled in as in possession. We haven't broke it down yet. Session two, we're trying to fit in a, a game somewhere in there, whether that's with the age group above or down, we're unsure. And then session three, we've just got it um, the out of possession stuff, maybe IDP. And then we're moving into a big game against Newcastle. So we know that there's been some cracking games over the last few years with these age groups. Um, very good side, you know. So we're, we're really looking forward to, to that challenge there. Um, we haven't fully put the week together yet, so we need to speak with the coaches on what it's going to look like. So this could change slightly um, depending on what uh, or how the meeting goes. But again, just want to say thank you for, for supporting the channel. Don't forget to press the like button. Um, that shows us that, you, that you're enjoying it um, and, and it spurs us on to keep doing more videos. If you haven't yet subscribed, press the subscribe button. There's still a lot of people out there who are watching the video but just not subscribed. Um, and then make sure that you turn on, on that notification button so you're one of the first to, to see this video on a weekly basis. But thank you again for your support. And we'll see you next week.